Okay, um, let's get going today. Um, so good afternoon and welcome to today's in-season webinar on fungicide resistance and um, fungicide strategies in canola. Um, so it's brought to you by the Australian Fungicide Resistance Extension Network, which is a mouth mouthful. So we just go with APRON for short. Uh, my name's Kylie, uh, Kylie Island, and I am the Extension Coordinator for APRON. Um, and I'll be facilitating today's session. Um, before we get started, some brief housekeeping, if I could just have the next slide, Steve. Yep, so basically everyone should already be muted already, so please keep on mute just to make sound easier. Uh, to ask a question, go to the Q&A window in the bottom of your screen, um, open it, enter your question, and you can also select to um, ask a question anonymously if you don't want your, quest, your name attached to that question. Um, and those questions just come through to us as panelists. Um, in the very unlikely event of a webinar hacking, um, we'll immediately shut it down and a new link will be sent to you within 10 minutes. Um, and we just ask that you be kind. And if I can have the next slide, Steve. Just to clarify how that Q&A looks on your screen and how it'll open up, um, you can see it's just a matter of clicking down in the bottom of your screen on that Q&A and you can see that there is an option there to send anonymously. Um, and then on our side, on the um, left hand side of your screen, you can see how we see the questions come through. Um, there is the chat option over in the side potentially, um, but uh, we ask in general that you send any questions through the Q&A is the best way. Uh, next slide, please, Steve. Um, so the Australian Fungicide Resistance Extension Network, um, it's basically a GRDC initiative, um, basically in recognition that um, fungicide resistance is a serious and increasingly prevalent problem in Australian grains. Um, and so we want to be able to deliver regionally specific resources and training to growers and advisors to help them understand the status risks and how they can manage for fungicide resistance. Um, and it does need to be regional because it does change all over Australia and in your different growing conditions, how it will have, how prevalent it might be or what the risks are. And so to do that, we're going to develop and deliver a fungicide resistance management guide, workshops, information sessions and webinars such as today's, as well as fact sheets, updates and email alerts. And you can follow us uh, online and using the hashtag AFRIN as well, or get in touch by email. Um, and we're able to deliver this by harnessing um, the skills and expertise of plant pathologists, fungicide resistance experts and comms and extension specialists across the country. Um, so you can see a lot of our partners on the left hand side there. And on the call with us today though from AFRIN, we've got Lauren and Bridget from Ag Communicators in the background helping us run this smoothly, um, as well as the absolute stars of the show today are of course our doctors Steve Marcroft and Angela Vander Val, hopefully, I meant to check how I pronounce that with Ange. <laughs> uh, and so Steve and Ange are um, likely not um, unfamiliar to many of you, they are leading experts in the field of black leg um, in Australia and with more than 35 years experience between them. Um, and together they coordinate the National Canola Pathology Programs funded by the GRDC, with Steve leading the field-based research and Ange the molecular aspects of the work. And their research has led to a really um, incredible genome to paddock approach um, for understanding how the disease works and developing managing management strategies to minimise its impacts. Uh, so without further ado, I will throw over to Steve and Ange um, to take us through um, what, what the go with canola is. Okay, thanks for that. So I'm assuming everyone can hear me. I can hear me, so that's good. Um, so I'm going to really talk about what's happening this year with, um, with blackleg and fungicide strategies for this year. Obviously, we're sort of halfway through the season, but there's obviously some very key decisions that people are going to be making in the next few weeks. So just, I guess, to take us back a bit and put us um, on track on one, how we got to where we are as in today. 2020 for most growers in Eastern Australia, at least in Southern Australia, has been an excellent start. 
crops got in early. Yeah, we had really good rains in April. The crops were sown early into good growing conditions, warm soils, etc., and the crops grew really strongly. Um, so we really got up through that really vulnerable seedling stage quite quickly. Um, and it really wasn't until mid-June that we started seeing, um, or early June, we started seeing really black legs starting to turn up. So that was the scenario that we had. Um, now I'm just going to go through some of the more, and more minor diseases um, and we'll talk about control strategies with fungicides as we go. So white leaf spot is probably one of the most common diseases of canola. You see white leaf spot in every single paddock that you go to. You'll see... If you look at the photo on the right there, white leaf spot is a lesion there compared to your black leg there, which has got the, um, the fruiting bodies in it. So that's really the diagnostic feature. The other interesting thing with um, white leaf spot, it often, obviously gets, sometimes it stucks on, on the, the veins and the, um, the midrib of the leaves. So you get these splotches occurring. Uh, like I said, it's very common. The nice thing with white leaf spot though is it's not systemic at all. So it's really reducing your photosynthetic area of the leaves. Um, it's not like black leg where it's going on and causing a crown canker or anything like that. It can, however, get very severe. Some reason in Hamilton in Victoria, it seems to be the area where you get very severe white leaf spot. And in some regions and some years, if it stays wet, um, it can start off like this and then really progress up the canopy and start taking off a lot of leaves. And although we don't have any data on this, unfortunately, it's highly probable that when it starts looking like this, that's when we're going to start seeing some yield loss. The really nice story of white leaf spot is that it's um, very, very easy to control. So, and virtually all the fungicides that we use for black leg will also control white leaf spot. So I just got some photos here of some trials from last year. Here's our untreated. You can see it's got white leaf spot and black leg. Um, Impact and furrow is controlling it. Jockey controls it. Um, but the STHIs are particularly good at controlling as well. So we'll see control with, you know, Olivo and Soltro and Moravis is also registered for control. So really, if you're looking at white leaf spot, all the black leaf treatments that you're currently putting on are also providing pretty good control of white leaf spot. Um, some people like in that Hamilton type region, I know do spray primarily for white leaf spots. So they're coming in with an early foliar for white leaf spot and then also picking up black leaf control. But for most people, it'll be the other way around. In most situations, white leaf spot probably isn't causing any yield loss. Um, but the nice thing is your um, black leaf fungicides will also provide some control. The next one we've seen a lot of this year, especially earlier on, it's sort of disappearing now as the plants are getting a little bit bigger and the older leaves are starting to senesce, is downy mildew. You photo here of downy mildew on the um, cotyledon and on first true leaf. And when you flip those leaves upside down, you'll see all this white fluffy mycelium on them. So look, in my experience, again, it's very common, but it really only affects those leaves, those first couple of leaves, which are really close to the soil because it, it really needs a lot of moisture down in mildew. So it really, in the worst situations, it knocks off your first true leaves so it can reduce the vigor of your crop. Um, but as soon as you start getting um, new leaves, they generally come through unaffected and the crop's right after that. Unfortunately, with downy mildew, there are no fungicides registered. Um, so now I'm going to move on to black leg. That's what we're all here for. So this is really when black leg started to show up. And I've got a photo here of an agronomist, um, Greg Toomey. Um, and this was the common situation. So I'm at the fifth leaf stage and I've got black leg and white leaf spot on the oldest leaf. Um, should I apply fungicide? Um, and I've had dozens of agronomists talking to me about that. So I'm just going to go back through a little bit of the epidemiology of black leg to try and answer this question. So we know that black leg, the issue isn't so much the leaf lesions. The issue that we have is the crown cankers. And we know that it's the disease we see in the seedling of a um, canola plant, which then leads to this, um, the crown cankers at the end of the year. So if you look at this pathogen, it's got to um, attack the cotyledon or the first leaves. It's got to cause lesions. And then it grows down within the vascular tissue down to the crown and causes a crown canker. And what we see is that it's this seedling stage which leads to the crown cankers that we see at the end of the year. So it's the first one, two, three, four leaves that we really try to protect. And that's why the seed treatments themselves are so important and such a fantastic tool and why the most highly um, 
the most efficient way of controlling it with a foliar is it coming quite early again, that four to six leaf stage, just to really give that small seedling complete protection. Once you get the crop through that seedling stage, subsequent infections we know don't contribute to more crown cankers. So we can push that foliar fungicide out to the 810 leaf stage, um, but as we push it further and further out, we get lower, lower efficacy. So really going back to that question then from the agronomist this year, should you um, protect your crop at the fifth to sixth leaf stage? If we sort of run through this, no. If you're, you've got good genetic resistance, so in my situation, I'm suggesting you've got an MR or above. If you've sown your crop early this year, so you've got that really good growth um, early in the season and you're up past that fifth leaf stage, and if your crop had a seed treatment on, then I would suggest that no, there's very limited benefit in that situation of um, applying a foliar fungicide at that five to six leaf stage. Conversely, if... Um, you're growing a cultivar with um, lower black leg ratings. Um, and in, the most important thing I think in this scenario is if you've particularly sown your crop later. So if you've sown it into May when the black legs turned up, so coming into that June period, if your crops are you know, only at the three leaf stage and you're seeing black leg on that second and third leaf, that's a much higher risk for crown canker. Um, and obviously if you haven't used a seed treatment, um, that makes it worse as well. So part of the situation was that in 2020, we had a lot of crops where people had grown good black leg ratings at the fifth leaf stage. They were starting to see the disease and we could confidently say, no, this year you don't need it. Um, foliar fungicide, we're very lucky. We got our crops in early. Um, our crops were established before the disease came in. But conversely, there were a number of people who had used retained seed or whatever and had grown MS type cultivars. In that situation, it was much harder to give that advice because the black leg rating really wasn't there um, and when the more susceptible your crop, the more effect you're going to get from a fungicide, obviously. So good story, I guess, to use a good black leg rating. So just coming through some of the scenarios, and I'm just going to show some photos from our trials here, um, just to help you make decisions on whether to put a fo earlier foliar fungicide on or not. So you can see here when I talk about seed treatments, this is the same cultivar here from our Lake Bolak black leg monitoring site, which um, we um, sow alongside the MVT um, trials with GRDC. And you can see here where we haven't used a foliar fungicide, those cotyledons have been completely colonized and invaded by black leg. Whereas when we use our STHI, Saltro in this case, um, those cotyledons are perfectly healthy. Um, and this is a key, key thing when I'm looking at black leg and whether I'm getting a response from a fungicide, it's when I get these cotyledons and first three leaves infected that I'm pretty confident I'm going to get a response from a fungicide. Whereas if I can protect those first few leaves with a seed treatment, then I'm pretty confident I won't need a foliar fungicide. Um, incidentally, you can see here in this one, um, the concentration of the, foliar, of the seed treatment sorry, is very high in those first few leaves and you see it's diluted in the older leaves and that's why these older leaves are now getting the lesions. When we talk about black leg ratings, this is at the same site. Um, we've got different cultivars from different resistance groups and different black leg ratings. Here's an MS cultivar at that site and without any foliar fungicide. And this is a yield site, so it's not canola on canola. It's a normal yield site. You can see here the cotyledons have been totally infected. The hypocotyls are infected and that plant's going to die. So just shows you just how important that genetic resistance is. Conversely here at the same site is our R-rated cultivar and um, you can see that it's doing extremely well. Um, and But this is probably the situation that a lot of growers will find themselves in, that they've um, got an MR type cultivar. So you can see here the cultivar has been infected by black leg, but at the same time that crown canker resistance is working and it hasn't become totally colonized like we saw in that previous slide. Um, so this is the situation where it gets more tricky or not to whether you put a foliar fungicide on. In this situation, if you had used the seed treatment and those cotyledons were nice and healthy, you would definitely say no. But because in this particular example, we didn't use a foliar fungicide and we have had the early infection, um, if you're in a more high rainfall situation, you would say that the, the, res the probability of getting a response from a foliar fungicide is much higher. So this decision of whether to use an early foliar fungicide or not, it's not clear cut. You've already got to look at the season, you've got to look at when I got my plant into the ground, when the infection came, what was the growth stage of the plant when it became infected, um, and then make that call. Um, but the, I guess the key warning signs are if I'm sowing late, 
my um, plants are staying in that one to three leaf stage during the infection period into the winter and I'm getting a lot of dead cotyledons and leaf lesions, that's when, um, that's when I think most people make that call to put the foliar fungicide on. Um, obviously this varies very different between seasons, sorry, regions. This is the same experiment now up in Horsham and you can see the black leaf at that particular time just hasn't turned up at all. It's just starting to come in now. Um, so again, we can confidently walk out into your crop, look at that, you're going, we're now at the third leaf stage and we're perfectly fine. Um, so again, no need to um, put a foliar fungicide on. I was a little bit suspicious in 2020 when we were coming into June, the season was looking so good, it was nice and wet, and we're starting to see the first lesions turning up. I thought we might do a bit of a 2016 year where black lead became very, very severe. So when agronomists were um, talking to me early June, I was saying, well, let's just hold off. We can make that decision, well, we can push that decision right out to the eight to 10 leaf stage. Um, and let's see if 2020 does turn into a 2016 type situation where black lead became really prolific. Um, fortunately, since then, um, you know, this, the winter hasn't actually been that wet. It stayed a lot drier and black leg is definitely there. It's ready to go and um, we've got leaf lesions, but it certainly hasn't become that severe that I think we need to put that foliar fungicide on. So that's the, um, I guess the crown canker part of that decision making process that we have to go through, whether to put a foliar fungicide on or not. Um, the second part of this talk um, is about upper canopy black leg infection, which I'm sure you've all heard about. And this is where instead of getting the leaves infected and it growing down to the crown, we're getting direct infection onto the reproductive parts of the plants. So you can see here, we get flowers infected, we get the whole tops of the plants infected, we get the pathogen growing from the flower into the stem and then causing these stem lesions. And what we now know is that this disease isn't just stopping there, it's actually getting inside the vascular tissue again and then reducing the amount of moisture and nutrition that goes to um, all the pods above that lesion. So that's really where the yield loss is being driven um, with upper canopy, upper canopy infection. So before I move on, one of the key drivers with upper canopy infection, unfortunately, is that we know that the same resistance mechanisms for the crown canker aren't operating for the upper canopy. So breeders have spent 30 years trying, or more than that now, since the 1970s, trying to breed crown canker resistance, and we've done a fantastic job. Um, however, for upper canopy, a lot of that resistance is not effective at all. So we know that when the major genes work, so when you have the resistance group like an ABDF, we know that um, that gives immunity to the plant and also gives immunity to upper canopy. However, where you don't have that major gene resistance, it, it's no longer correlated. So you can have an R-rated cultivar, which is say a group A or a group B, and you're totally susceptible to upper canopies. And this is why we see really, really high yield responses to fungicides because it's spraying a completely susceptible crop. So um, as I said, we routinely pick up 20% yield losses. Um, when we get um, upper canopy and pot infection combined, we can pick up 40% yield losses. As I said, that effective major gene resistance is very good, but if you don't have effective major gene resistance, you are completely susceptible. And that is the case for most canola cultivars in Australia. Um, and because of that, we know that the foliar fungicides are fantastic um, at controlling um, upper canopy. And we've done a lot of work with different timings and we know around that 30% bloom spray is the best time for um, achieving control with upper canopy. So the final point with upper canopy though, is again, it's not completely straightforward. It's about the, it, the pathogen needs time from the infection period to then actually get inside the vascular tissue and cause the damage. So we know that when crops start flowering early, um, certainly in July, early August, then the pathogen has time to cause the damage to the vascular tissue and we get big yield responses and fungicides. That same amount of disease can look exactly the same but occur in late August and then the pathogen doesn't have time to block the vascular tissue. We don't see big responses from foliar fungicides. So unfortunately, it's not quite straightforward. But really, what I'm going to suggest to you guys, because we're coming into this period this um, over the next couple of weeks, and in fact, I've already seen a couple of crops in my travels where it's starting to flower. And the situation is because 2020 we sowed our crops early because we had that fantastic break to the season, it means our crops are going to be running up and flowering earlier, maybe the normal, and therefore we're going to 
although we've escaped our crown canker this year, we're actually potentially pushing ourselves into an upper canopy window. So this is the scenario I'm talking about. When you go out and monitor crops, you can see here black legs present. You can see here it's not just present on the older leaves, it's moved up the canopy, which means we've got new infections occurring. So we know that the black legs there, and if your crop is pushing up and commencing flowering late July, early August, these are all the warning signs that you may get a big response from a foliar fungicide. So if you don't have leaf lesions, that means either the pathogen is not there or it means that your major gene resistance is effective. So you don't have to worry about black leg, no lesions, no worry. Um, but if you are seeing those lesions, you are seeing them moving onto new leaves and you're going to flower early, they're all the key indicators at this stage that we can tell you that you're likely to get a yield response from foliar fungicides. Um, so that's, I guess, the strategy behind the foliar fungicides. And now I want to quickly talk about Crop Life Australia. So this is a group of experts who put together um, the, the recommendations on how to use the different fungicides. And really, what before I go through this table here, this well, as I go through this table, this table gives you the recommendations or for every single scenario you can think of. So it's about whether you used um, an in furrow whether you, and, or a seed dressing, and then whether you've used an earlier foliar at that um, four to six to eight leaf stage, and then whether you've come back in with a sclerotinia spray at the 20 to 50 um, stage, and you just read it down and it gives you the different options that you've got. So at this stage, you've got five options. So if you use no, no fungicide on the seed dressing, no fungicide early on, and then you've still got all your options available to you at that um, upper canopy stage. Um, if you've used an STHI, a uh, chemical from group seven early on, um, then the, really the recommendation is that you can't use another STHI for a foliar. So the thing we're trying to avoid with the STHIs, we know that resistance um, will evolve in STHIs. So the thing we're really trying to avoid is using them as a seed treatment and then again using them as an earlier foliar because we think we, that's putting the pathogen really through a bottleneck and will select for resistance very quickly. Whereas the later timings, we think that's quite separate again. So you can put two STHIs on a crop, but we don't want two on the seedling stage. We can have one on early and one on late, but not two together. Um, so like I said, you can work through this chart. Um, the 11s is the strobilurins, um, and then you can work out from that um, what options you've got for um, rotating fungicides. But just before I hand over to Ange, one of the things I want to say is here, obviously the best way to controlling fungicide resistance is to reduce fungicide use. And I think like this year is a classic for that because we got the crops in very early, it means that we can avoid this foliar fungicide um, use altogether for most crops, which then gives us our full options again later in the year and we're not putting the pathogen under enormous selection pressure. So I guess it's about trying to um, be strategic in our fungicide use is the best strategy that we've got at this stage. And again, like if you're um, not growing in a wheat canola, um, canola, wheat, canola wheat situation, um, you may not need a seed treatment, especially if you're sowing early, et cetera. So you can, um, you can avoid that potentially. Um, the other thing is with the STHIs, um, they are really a step above the old DMI technology um, for black plague. And therefore, if you're using an MR cultivar with an STHI, the chances are in most situations you won't need that foliar anyway or you're wasting your money with that foliar because the SDHI seed treatment is so good. So I think over the next few years we'll really work out how to best use these new SDHIs but um, I think because they are so good it does give us that opportunity to um, actually reduce the number of fungicide applications in our crops. Um, our, and then with this crop life it also goes on to advice on what your options are if you're looking at a second application for um, for uh, sclerotinia. Okay, I'll pass it over. Apologies, I keep, you'd think I'd know to unmute myself by now. Uh, just please keep the questions coming. Um, don't feel like you're talking into a void there either if you have been sending questions through. Thank you for that. Um, hopefully we did answer um, that particular question just now, um, but uh, what we'll do is we'll do a Q&A session at the end just so that um, we can keep everyone's time on track. Cheers. And now over to Ange. Thanks, Kylie. Uh, so I'm just going to talk uh, about the current situation in Australia with respect to fungicide resistance. 
So this is work that's been funded through an ARC linkage grant uh, between the University of Melbourne, Mark Ross Grains Pathology and Syngenta. It's been running for a few years now. And so as part of that work, we have been screening populations um, that have been sent in from growers and agronomists from across the country. So this map just shows you uh, that we've got a nice spread um, of samples from pretty much all of the major canola growing regions. And we use these samples then to screen for resistance um, through a, what we're calling an implanter assay. So essentially what we do is we have our seedlings here. Um, they've been treated with all the different fungicides that are currently available to um, control blackleg. And we use the stubble that you can see here to naturally infect the seedlings underneath. So essentially the sexual spores will be released from the stubble. They'll land on the little seedlings underneath and they'll cause infection. So we leave these set up uh, for around 30 hours. So each one of these tubs represents a different population. And then uh, we leave the seedlings for around um, two to three weeks and we look at lesion development. So here's an example of our untreated control here on the left. And you can see we've got nice big lesions developing. Um, we've got seedlings that are, colla uh, sorry, cotyledons that are actually collapsing. Um, and we actually do get hypocotyl infection as well. And this is an example here then of our SDHI treatment. So this is under the exact same um, disease pressure situation. And you can see there's not a single lesion developed um, for that chemistry. This compares to our DMIs over here, which are our, this is an example of a fungicide resistant population. So you can see here, um, this entire plant is infected and it's actually collapsing from infection. The hypercotyls all infected. Uh, we've got PDLs um, infected here and we've got lesions developing on the cotyledons as well. So we can count the number of lesions that are um, coming up on each of the different treatments uh, and we can work out which populations have resistance and which don't. The great news is that for the two years of screening, our 2018 and our 2019, we haven't seen any resistance at all to our SDHIs or our strobilurin fungicides. So um, this is a really positive outcome. Um, one of the things that's quite unique about the work that we've been doing is that we're looking at um, the status of fungicide resistance before these fungicides really take off and start being used on a high scale. So often fungicide resistance work is um, sort of undertaken once there is a problem. Um, so this has been a really nice uh, way to get this baseline information out there so that we do know that we don't have any resistance at the moment um, and we can start monitoring things and see what happens as these fungicides become more and more popular in the field. Um, the DMIs are a very different story, however. Uh, so for our flutriophol and our jockey, we have around 25% um, of our populations that have a high level of resistance. Uh, it is also important to note that these fungicides have been used for around 20 years now. So um, the fact that we've got only 25% of the populations that have resistance, I think is a really a positive thing. Um, for our Prezaro, uh, that's our foliar fungicide, we have around 7% of the populations have resistance. And this fungicide has been um, on the market a lot um, for a lot less time. So I think 2011 that was released. Um, we are doing these screens again in 2020. They, we actually just set the first lot up last week. Um, if anyone does want to still submit samples for this year, they can, but we would need them by the end of next week. Um, oh, sorry, two weeks time. Um, so uh, our details are at the end if you do want to sub um, submit some samples. Um, with the screens that we've been doing, we've also been collecting individual isolates so that we can have a look at them in a bit more detail and try and figure out what actually is um, leading to this resistance. So this is an example of six isolates here that were collected in 2018. And um, we've got two susceptible isolates here as controls on the end. Um, essentially what we do is we take the isolates and we inoculate them on individual seedlings that have been treated with um, the various fungicides. So we've got flutriophol, fluconazole, and our tebaconazole, prethiconazole mixture. And you can see that our resistant isolates are, um, have caused a lot more disease than our susceptible controls. But one thing that is important to note that if you didn't have any fungicides, all of these isolates would be giving a score of around seven. So we do see disease in the presence of the fungicides, but it isn't a complete um, overcoming of, this, of the fungicides. They still do have some effect on each of the isolates. And that's a really important thing to note because it means that uh, um, although the efficacy has decreased um, for these fungicides, they're not completely overcome for the DMIs. Uh, we have also done a lot of work at trying to figure out what is actually causing 
uh, this resistance. So work done uh, at the University of Melbourne with Alex Ibnam, um, we found that for some of the isolates, we have an insertion in the um, region of the gene that regulates the expression. So CYP51 is the target of these fungicides. And what we find is some isolates have a really big insertion in the, in the promoter region. Others have a small insertion and that is affecting the expression of the gene, uh, which then leads to the resistance. But we also have a number of isolates that don't have any mutations whatsoever in this gene. And so we're still trying to figure out what's going on with those isolates. So, what does all this work mean for industry? Well, essentially the great news is, like I said, we haven't detected any um, resistance to the SDHIs or the strobilurin fungicides. Um, we will keep monitoring these and see what happens as these fungicides start to get used on a, on a wider scale. Um, although we do know that 25 to 30% of the populations have resistance to flutriophol um, and or jockey, we don't actually know what proportion of the isolates within a population are resistant. So we can only say, yes, there's resistance there or no, there's not. We don't know whether within a population, 5% of the isolates are resistant, 50% of the isolates are resistant or 0.005% of the isolates are resistant. So um, that's still work we're trying to investigate further. Um, but what it does mean is we can't be sure what the impact um, of these resistant isolates has on the fungicide efficacy. Um, so we are working uh, again with Syngenta and trying to look at ways we can investigate this and try and figure out what's going on. Uh, because we do have markers for the, some of the fungicide resistant mechanisms, we can now look at screening populations to work out what the frequency is um, of at least these resistant isolates within a population. And that'll go a long way uh, towards understanding um, what's happening on a field level. But like I said, not all the isolates have this insertion in their promoter. So we still need to figure out what these other mechanisms are um, and how we can then monitor them in the field. Uh, lastly, like I said, the 2020 screens are underway. Um, if you do want to submit samples, we really would need them in the next two weeks. Um, if you do submit samples, you will get back um, the data for each one of those samples um, in terms of uh, what frequency, uh, whether your isolates have resistance or not, um, and you'll also get that compared to the national averages. Um, so we will leave it there. Uh, obviously, we want to thank the agronomists and growers that have submitted samples for the fungicide resistance screening. Um, obviously, GRDC that funds a lot of the field-based stuff and also um, ARC Linkage and Syngenta for the fungicide work. I'll hand over to you, Kylie. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Ange. That was fantastic. Um, so I'll just give people a few minutes um, to ask some questions just while I quickly go through a couple of slides on AFRIN. So this is just to let you know that, yeah, we've got a lot of people across the country um, and we'd encourage you to get in touch if you're um, really keen on fungicide resistance. Um, can I grab the next slide, Ange? Because um, uh, there are a lot of cases across Australia, it does differ depending on your growing conditions um, and just uh, different types of histories and um, there's a lot of nuances in fungicide resistance so um, we'd encourage you to uh, get in touch with Apron um, if you're interested. So the next slide please. And the way you can do that um, is by following the Apron hashtag um, on the and the GRDC on Twitter, going to grdc.com.au forward slash AFRIN um, or emailing, it'll go to me here at AFRIN at curtain.edu.au. Um, and I'll just get you to press the button there, Ange, and um, we've got two more webinars coming up um, planned in the near future, one for New South Wales and Queensland and for the high rainfall zone growers as well. So um, we really are trying to get down to those kind of regional and crop specific um, issues. Uh, so yeah, there's Steve and Angie's contact details um, and yeah, please send in samples if you are interested in figuring out if you've got anything happening in your fields. Um, so I guess I'll go to questions. The quick, quickest one is to go, we have one th come in through the chat. Um, I guess this is for, for Steve or, and or Ange. Um, are there particular environmental conditions that will drive upper canopy black leg infections? 
Yep, sure, I can take that one. Um, so yes, there are. So the conditions which normally drive normal black leg will also drive upper canopy. So it's very much distance to canola stubble and higher rainfall. Um, the complication with our canopy, unfortunately, is because, as I said, in most cultivars, there is no genetic resistance. It means if you are in a low rainfall environment and you get a slow amount of disease, but you get it early in the growing season, it can still cause significant yield loss. Um, and work that Syro's done has shown that the more moisture stress you put on the plants post and um, post flowering, um, the more yield loss you actually get for the same amount of damage. So it's, like I said, we're up a canopy. We've still got a lot to learn. Um, but generally, like I said, the same rules of thumb apply that if you're not seeing a lot of leaf lesions, then um, you're probably pretty safe if you are seeing leaf lesions. So if you are in a low rainfall environment, and you're having a good year and you're seeing a lot of leaf lesions, well, then you're probably going to have the same issue as everyone else. However, if you're in a lower rainfall environment and there's not much canola in your region and um, therefore you haven't got a lot of stubble and you're not getting a lot of infection, then you're pretty safe. So I would really, really get out and scout your crops and look for leaf lesions as the crops are bolting to get an idea if you're going to have a problem or not. Thanks for that, Steve. Um, I think we answered this, but it probably um, doesn't hurt to go over it again. Um, just basically that if you use an SDHI on seed, you really shouldn't use an SDHI on foliar um, and the messaging around that, Steve? Yeah, that's correct. So they're the two timings we don't want to use the same chemistry on because um, we think we'll put the pathogen through a bottleneck and select for it. It's got to be said, a lot of this work and recommendations is based on theory. Um, however, as in, Ange was saying, now they've got the molecular markers to be able to track it. Hopefully we'll actually get some real hard data behind all of that work. I don't know if you want to comment, Ange? Yeah, well, I guess um, the markers will allow us to investigate some of these actual scenarios in field-based situations and then get a better idea of what the best rotation strategies are because like Steve said they are just theory at the moment um, so we're working um, alongside a lot of the companies trying to figure out what's the best options for us to go forward with. Yep. No and it's always nicer to know before you see it get a farmer or a grower <laughs> calling you from the field um, which has happened in a lot of the other cases in Australia so um, that's great. Yeah, Great I think it's really important to, to note that, you know, the work that um, we've done with in uh, collaboration with Syngenta, um, yeah, is really unique in the sense that, you know, it's not often you're looking at fungicide resistance before there is a problem. Um, and so I think it's, it puts us in a good position moving forward um, because we can monitor things and, you know, we will detect if there's changes, um, hopefully in enough time to be able to then, you know, change things. Yeah. Because I guess that links to the next question of, you know, what's the um, kind of story with Steptoria um, and or blackleg both in Australia and abroad that would make you worry about fungicide resistance? Yeah, well, I guess um, blackleg is a sexually reproducing pathogen. Um, we also have huge population numbers. Um, and so it's, it is a high risk pathogen for evolving to genetic resistance, overcome genetic resistance. And therefore, if it can overcome fungicide resistance, it's likely it would um, under the right selection pressure. So that's why we really need to stay on top of things and make sure um, we are monitoring and, and trying to do the right things with the fungicides up front and not hammer the system too hard. Yeah, yeah, because the good news is, yeah, Blackleg, we have, yeah, it's about that risk factor. And sclerotinia, there's been some cases in Europe from my understanding, but we haven't seen anything like that at all in Australia, which is good good news. Yep. yep. Um, I think the other thing, like Steve said, is to really, um, fungicides aren't our only option. You know, we have great genetic resistance. We also, you know, we ha are seeing this situation where if we're sowing early and escaping disease, there is no need to follow up with that um, foliar, early foliar fungicide. So save your fungicide decisions to the upper canopy stage mm -hmm. um, of the growth. So, um, you know, we have got multiple options. We don't have to be completely reliant on the fungicides, which puts us in a pretty good position. Yeah, no worries. Um, and I guess that, yeah, that just um, goes into the next question maybe like, so if you don't have fungicide resistance, do you need to even worry about managing for fungicide resistance? I think we've covered that, but it, once again, just bears saying. 
yeah, I think we always need to uh, assume that fungicide resistance can evolve if um, we put too much selection pressure on. So the more you can do to reduce the pressure, the better. Yeah. Yeah, I think we see that with um, when we monitor our major genes. So we know in Australia, when you reduce, uh, introduce a new major gene, you um, we get about three years use out of it um, before the pathogen overcomes that. So we see the pathogen evolving to our resistance in our cultivars all the time. But when we're not growing, you know, those canola wheat canola rotations in the high rainfall zone, those genes can last for years and years and years. So it is very much the farming system which is driving the, um, the genetic change of the pathogen. So if you are growing a lot of canola and using a lot of fungicides, you'll end up resistance. Um, and if you're not, if it's a, you know, a one in four year crop for you, correct, you probably don't have to worry so much. Brilliant. Um... Well, I don't have any other questions coming through. Um, so we'll give everyone an early mark today. Um, but thanks so much, Angela and Steve, um, for your presentation today. Did you have any last comments or anything like that? Um, no, just um, good luck over the next few weeks and we'll see what pans out with <laughs> upper canopy. I'm hoping it's nice and wet so where there's plenty of black lead getting around, but uh, more importantly, we've got high yield potential. Very true. Brilliant. Awesome. Uh, so with that, I'll bring uh, the webinar to a close and thank you all for uh, attending and please get in touch with Apron and uh, we'll happily share more advice with you over the next couple of years. Cheers. <laughs>